Sure. So welcome and thank you for joining us for this event on what governments and the private sector can do to achieve zero hunger in the face of a multi-dimensional crisis. This is a side event of the Zero Hunger Coalition. Our goal today is to introduce you to the Zero Hunger Coalition and show you how the coalition is catalyzing coordinated action between governments, donors, UN agencies, civil society, and the private sector with the goal of transforming food systems to end hunger for all. We do have simultaneous translation into French and English, so please find your channel. We also have a number of people joining us um, online virtually, so welcome. Sorry you're not here with us in person, but thank you for joining us. This year has seen a huge outpouring of initiatives to respond to the global food crisis from the UN's crisis group to the Global Alliance on Food Security and the Food and Agricultural Resilience Mission Farm of the European Union and France. Um, Maximo, please come and join us. I think there's a seat for you. to the hunger crisis. And we heard about this multiple He's just joined us from FAO and I, we wrote a blog earlier this year calling for three things to manage these risks. The first thing we called for was better coordination to try and use our collective energy to channel collaboration and cooperation and not competition. To second, to make sure that as we respond to the emergency we have before us, that we do not undermine the need for more and better investment, long-term investment in sustainable agri-food systems. And third, that we cannot rely on governments alone. To me, this is the spirit of the Zero Hunger Coalition. And this is what we're gonna to showcase today. The coalition has been endorsed by the G7 in multiple communiques. There are 26 governments, countries who have either joined or express, expressed their support. And there are 44 companies that have made financial pledges through the Zero Hunger Private Sector Pledge. This is the perfect mix for matchmaking and for pooling resources that can be invested in the 10 high impact areas that emerged from the Ceres 2030 report that I was part of a few years ago. We're honored to have a great lineup of speakers here today who will be talking about what they are doing to contribute to the goals of the Zero Hunger Coalition. I wanna first recognize the organizations that have been working together for the past months to drive the coalition forward. GAIN, the FAO, IFAD, WFP, and my organization, the Shamba Center. But I also want to recognize our other co-organizers co for this event, who've all been very actively engaged in supporting the work of the coalition. Nigeria, Zambia, the European Commission, and next to me, the private sector pledge, the private sector mechanism. The private sector mechanism, the PSM, have been so instrumental in helping drive more private sector investment from their huge pool of members. And I'm happy that Michael's here today to help announce our latest pledge tally. But I wanna start with the, um, the three UN Rome-based agencies who are really at the heart of this agenda and whose missions underpin everything we do today. 
So I want to start with them, but I got a very special request from Ambassador Olaniran from Nigeria, who's a dear friend and who has been such an important individual for six decades fighting around these issues. He's asked kindly, he needs to leave. He's got an urgent appointment that's emerged. So I'm going to take his special request and give him the floor um, first, and then I move back to the three U UN agencies. So Ambassador Olaniran, um, there's just been a, a report that's been released um, um, by IFPRI, the International Food Policy Research Institute, and the International Inst Institute for Sustainable Development, IISD, where I was before I joined the Shamba Center. And it provides an evidence-based and costed roadmap for how Nigeria can achieve this food system transformation that we're all desperate to achieve. Can you share with us your, your reactions to this report? What Nigeria is now going to do to implement it and how you think the Zero Hunger Coalition can help? Ambassador, you have the floor. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> Thank you so much, um, Karen. And I apologize for coming first. Those who know me know that I normally don't do that. But then somehow I've been saddled with managing the three agencies. So I juggle my time and uh, my interests. This is uh, a report of reports. And I believe that the practicality of the evidence-based research that has gone into it makes it absolutely important to get governments on the side of a report like this. It's not too wordy. It's not exaggerating. There are facts and figures. Having said that, it's also important to see where the pitfalls are and what can be done to take care of those. We all know the big elephants, not elephants now, many big elephants in the room ranging from COVID to conflict to the invasion of Ukraine by Russia and the fallouts, which everybody seems to be grappling with. But specifically for Nigeria, and this is important, we are dealing with a population of at least 200 million people. And with a youth bulge, I normally describe that as the gunpowder of which we are all sitting on. If nothing is done to diffuse it, then there could be some serious problems for the whole of West Africa and indeed for Africa. Part of the problem that needs to be solved is beyond CFS or the Hunger Coalition. It has to do with how serious or how committed the UN Security Council wants to be. The whole of West Africa and particularly the northern part of Nigeria, which is now infiltrated into the south are riddled with conflicts, armed conflicts, kidnapping. And so that does not provide us with the platform to make things work the way we want it. Having said that, we are people of hope. We must keep pushing and doing the needful. Now, 
what we are trying to resolve today is not something that happened overnight. Poor investment in every sense of it. Traditionally, agriculture in Africa and in Nigeria has always been poorly, poorly financed. So the investment is poor. The yield, because of the materials that are being used, are also very low. The quality, the quality of the products are not the best. Now, if you not want something in terms of higher yield and better quality, you have to go along with the latest research, which costs money. And on the other hand, you have a population of farmers that are over 65. And most of them are not quite uh, at least scientifically literate enough to absorb certain uh, uh, technologies and so on. Now that's where we are. <clears throat> we need to get a few things straight. One, because of the low productivity gap, especially as a result of livestock not being sufficient, emphasis should be placed on that. Two, investment gap on climate adaptation requires a huge, huge amount of resources that must be put in place. Nutrition education, you may produce the highest quality food, be it animal, protein, be it plant, but if the people do not have understanding of eating them and eating them in the right proportion, and particularly paying emphasis on the children, we may not get the result we want and that we need. Uh, the fourth point has to do with food loss and food waste. For me, that should be number one because it's a low hanging fruit that does not require too much work to get it done, but infrastructure must be provided, the necessary framework in terms of policies and back up by governments with laws Will, must be done. Now, there is a deficit. How do we take care of the gap? Nigeria, for some time, have been doing very, very well, but suddenly uh, things started going bad and the donor community have left us. So how can we get them back with our own effort to stimulate the the need for. ODA gap is about 2.3 billion per annum. Nigeria needs to provide her own two to make it workable. If these resources are put in place, we are likely going to take care of most of the negatives. Greenhouse gas emission reduction, and then improve the standard of living. Allow me to stop here. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Ambassador. And sorry for, for pushing you along, but we do have a very full panel and, and not a huge amount of time. So without further ado, I think this man needs no introduction to all of you here. Maximo Torero, the Chief Economist of the FAO. Hey, thank you. Thank you very much, Karen. I'm sorry, I was a little bit late. And thank you all. So let me first uh, formally, excellencies and ladies and gentlemen, welcome you also on behalf of the FAO Director General and together with my colleagues from the World Food Program and the International Fund for Agricultural Development to this side event on achieving zero hunger. And what can governments and the private sector do in face of the multidimensional crisis? And for sure, civil society has to play a role uh, because it's part of the continuum between governments and private sector, civil society, all of them have to play a role. Now, uh, as the Ambassador was saying, the challenge is big. Uh, 
we are far away from achieving zero hunger, uh, as we presented early this morning. So we need to find ways in which we can be more effective uh, and efficient in the way we try to cope this problem as fast uh, as possible. And CFS provides a platform where we can discuss these topics. Uh, but we need to bring uh, very clear solutions and very effective solutions to this, to this challenge. And this is where evidence uh, plays a crucial role, but also means of implementation and commitments. So the CERES exercise of ending hunger by 2030, the CERES 2030 initiative, did a very important step forward by trying to capture uh, for, by doing enormous literature reviews, which we were part of some of them, uh, but also in trying to bring which will be the most cost effective investments that are required so that we can use the restricted resources we have. That's one approach to move, and that's something that we need to look at it. Of course, that needs to be work with the countries too, and that was part of the agreement of the transformation pathways with the countries. And the evidence helps to start a starting point of discussion and trying to bring that in relation to the arrangements that are already in place and what the countries identify as part of their priorities. In our case, working with this evidence also, we are moving forward with the means of implementation of us, which is the Hand in Hand Initiative. And the Hand in Hand Initiative is trying to bring and identify those investments at a subnational level through territorial approaches so that we can accelerate the process of reduction of hunger by taking advantage of locations in the countries where there is significant potential for agricultural development, where agriculture for FAO covers forestry, crops, livestock, fisheries, aquaculture, uh, and will allow, accelerate the process of transformation. And why we need to, to accelerate that process of transformation is because, as I mentioned earlier, we are completely off track and off path of achieving SDG2. And the crises that we have been living in the last three years has not helped at all. On the contrary, it has exacerbated even more the situation. So what we hope is that uh, the examples of the meeting today, the examples that we will have on contributions from stakeholders in governments and from the private sector of ending hunger could help enormously to contribute to this. And we will have representatives from the private sector, uh, which will bring examples and commitments by companies where our role is also to assess how that is progressing. So it's not just to have the list of commitments, but it's also to assess and have some accountability of what those commitments are achieving in the time so that we can track progress and bring that progress towards achievement. And the same applies on the side of the government. In our Hand in Hand initiative, we have a, an online permanent monitoring tool to track what is happening. So for government and private sector actors to work to go together towards a common goal, uh, it is not trivial. And do we need to look at the pledges and try to complement them with what the government identify bottom up as the priorities that they need to, to evolve. So the contributions in these sessions will provide important pointers to these and similar questions, or they may raise others that we need to bring up. So I invite you to listen carefully to the contributions, and I am keen to receive your feedback from the discussions. Your input will help building the next section of the road for achieving zero hunger through collaborative work under the Zero Hunger Coalition and related initiatives. I look forward to your active participation and thank you all for your contributions. But I want to flag that this is a time of solidarity, but also is a time, as I mentioned before, of gaining efficiencies and effectiveness. So thank you very much. And I hope we have a great discussion today. Thank you, um, Maximo. Um, we are now gonna have um, the Associate Vice President of IFAD, Ms. Satu Santala. Um, who's another active um, part of the Zero Hunger Coalition. And we have a video message. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to be part of opening this important discussion on achieving zero hunger. IFAD is committed to work towards achieving zero hunger by 2030 which is now more pressing and challenging as we face a food crisis. IFAD focuses on eliminating rural poverty and building the livelihoods of small-scale farmers and rural populations. Small-scale farmers have a significant role in eradicating hunger 
and they contribute to the food and nutrition security of their communities and the world. Yet, rural populations are at the crossroads of many environmental, social and economic challenges, such as the COVID pandemic, high food, fertilizer and energy prices, and climate change. Our current food systems cannot account for this. They are generating adverse outcomes that affect small-scale farmers, such as biodiversity loss, land and water degradation, and resource scarcity. The resilience of the rural poor has been stretched thin. To end hunger and malnutrition requires a real transformation. That's why it's essential that we join forces and align action around policies, practices and resources. If I'd appreciate the collaboration with the Rome-based agencies on these areas. The Zero Hunger Coalition is an important partnership to do this. It facilitates responses to countries asking for assistance to build stronger agri-food systems after crises and shocks. Collaboration and coordination is key to supporting governments who have a big role in rural food system transformation. IFAD itself is supporting governments to build capacity and create environments that support rural food system development through policy and legislation. This helps bolster agricultural production so that more people have access to healthy diets. If it is also working with private sector actors to bring more healthy food choices to all people. This means working with small and medium scale enterprises to develop value chains that reduce food loss and waste, uh, ensure food safety, promote healthy food and drive economic development of rural populations. Supporting and investing in this type of comprehensive approach is something governments and the private sector can do to help transform how food is produced, distributed and consumed. We need global commitments that are underpinned by financing and focus on country-level action and results. This is how we can work together to transform food systems for people and planet and to end hunger and malnutrition. Thank you. Thank you, Ifad. Um, and last but not least, Tim Hunter, who's the Director of Private Sector Par Partnerships and Fundraising at the World Food Programme. Tim, you have the floor. Thanks, Karen. And it's very good to be um, with you this afternoon, uh, ladies, gentlemen, and excellencies. Uh, in the opening plenary, we heard about the scale and depth of the current food crisis. Uh, the president of IFAD called it grim. <clears throat> Last week I was on the operational task force um, um, call for WFP's response in Somalia. We were being briefed by our deputy director for nutrition um, who was talking to us from the IDP camp outside Baidoa in uh, southern uh, Somalia. Uh, she talked about the families, the children, the mothers, streaming in to the uh, IDP camp there. She called that grim. That's the human face of the global food crisis that we're talking about. We must remember for all of these things, there are thousands, tens of thousands, millions of human faces. And we do, do truly face a multi-dimensional crisis. Governments must and are stepping up to address the immediate crisis, providing extraordinary levels of support to organizations like the World Food Programme, but others as well. But at the same time, and it's not a choice, it has to be in parallel, we have to double down on the root causes of the current crisis and emphasize the transformation that the Food Systems Summit focused on to avoid the spiral of crises in which we find ourselves now. And that's where the private sector is vital. And the Zero Hunger Pledge, the Zero Hunger Coalition plays a critical role, as does the CFS and the private sector mechanism as a platform to bring together the focus and the attention of private sector. WFP has an active and broad engagement across the private sector, aiming to help assist in the bringing about of transformation, working at a systems level through partnerships such as the Farm to Market Alliance, 
looking to harness the power of the market uh, uh, through the procurement that WFP undertakes, but also linking up public procurement activities, such as that supporting um, school feeding activities with local farmers, local producers, to create a sustainable um, um, uh, solution uh, to improve nutrition. We have to work across all of these initiatives while ensuring, as Karen said, there is coherence and there is impact and there is evidence. Uh, we're delighted to be part of this and will continue to support the work of the Zero Hunger Coalition. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. So we ended with a pretty um, important reminder of how grim the situation we currently um, are in. And I think WFP in particular is really at the front line of trying to help avert this um, humanitarian um, disaster. But we also heard about the how vital the private sector is. Um, and we heard that from, from IFAD as well, about the importance particularly of SMEs, uh, small and medium enterprises, their role in food value chains, their role in providing more nutritious food not just more food, whatever the quality is, more food safety. We also heard from IFAD about the importance of collaboration and coordination, which I think has to underpin everything we do going forward. Um, and we heard from Maximo about how we can translate these global initiatives into actual investments on the ground through things like the Hand in Hand initiative, where we can match private sector pledges with government priorities that have been identified based on, on evidence. And we heard from Nigeria about the need for climate change and climate change adaptation to be at the forefront, for us to think not only about the production level, but about nutrition education and how we change the way consumers choose what they eat. Um, and the huge livestock productivity gap in Nigeria that he spoke about. But not only the livestock productivity gap, the public investment gap, the aid gap that Nigeria has, which is quite alarming, $2.3 billion um, dollars a year in an investment gap. Um, we're now going to hear from, from Zambia, who's one of the co-organizers of this panel. Um, and um, um, Z Zambia has is going to share with us their country experience. We have um, Ambassador Dr. Kayoya Masua um, from Zambia. Um, Dr. Masua, listening to what you heard from our previous speakers in Nigeria, how do you think Zambia could benefit from the types of country costed exercises we hear about, of things like the Hand in Hand initiative? And can you see a role for the Zero Hunger Coalition to support Zambia? Dr. Masua, you have the floor. And sorry, I forgot to invite up because now we have a seat. We have our 10th um, panelist, Steve Godfrey from GAIN joining us. So Steve, please join us on the, the, the podium. Zambia, you have the floor. Um, thank you very much, moderator, and for the introduction. And good afternoon, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, distinguished delegates. Um, as we gather here today, a tough reality confronts the global economy and especially uh, the developing world. A series of harsh events and unprecedented macroeconomic policies are combining to throw development into crisis. This has consequences for all of us due to the interlinked nature of the global economy. The developing world is facing an extremely challenging multidimensional or overlapping crisis, the COVID-19 pandemic, the climate change and conflicts which have shaped uh, by sharply high food fertilizer and energy prices, rising interest rates and credit spreads. These shock waves have hit food systems, uh, even in my country and a lot of uh, food systems in developing countries. At the same time, when many developing countries are struggling in their areas of governance and rule of law, debt sustainability, climate adaptation and mitigation, and limited physical budgets to counteract the severe reversals 
in agriculture development that were caught or caused by the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, including the reversals that are supposed to be made in health and education. I want to take this uh, opportunity to note that there are many other aspects of developmental crisis that also required global efforts. These include adaptation of climate change, mitigation of greenhouse gas emissions, deprivation facing women uh, and girls, and severe reversals in education, health, and debt sustainability. To unwind this imbalance, it requires multidimensional responses to multidimensional crises, including containment measures and actions to mitigate social economic impact that must be designed to close connection to each other. Considering indirect impacts in these sectors and maximizing synergies among different sectoral responses. Uh, Multidimension, multidisciplinary competences and expertise are required. In zero hunger pathways to sustainable food system development must link their responses towards collective outcomes rooted in the sound understanding of local needs and enable local leadership. Climate related disaster, natural disasters in Zambia are impacting agriculture, production, livelihood of people across sectors of the economy. And to support this climate action, the country needs massive investments, concessional finance and grants to enable their energy, transport and agriculture transition. Zambia has identified concrete impactful projects through the zero hunger pathways to sustainable food systems. And policies in these areas would build a financing mechanism and help to facilitate the global community support and initiative. We are working with public and private partners, uh, shareholders, stakeholders on these challenges in the recognition that much more needs to be done in these areas. We note that the costed roadmaps improve transparency and requires a new pragmatic approach for local realities and capacities. The government of Zambia is fully engaged in the food system pathways that will accelerate actions under the framework of national development plans as the country pursues to reach its 2030 vision. Realistic, the government is in, uh, in our assessments and uh, eager to work on solutions, including with all of you participating here today. Thank you, moderator. Thank you, Ambassador. Our next speaker is Dr. Conrad Rain from the European Commission, and who is also the co-chair of the Global Donor Platform for Rural Development. Conrad, do you think we can rely on other donors to help these countries get the additional public investment they need, get the additional ODA they need um, to be able to finance these investment plans? <clears throat> Thank you, Karen, and thank you for the invitation to this important side event. Let me start by saying that the EU is supporting the Zero Hunger Coalition strongly and is also co-organizing this event. And let me elaborate a bit, um, if I may, in my five minutes, uh, Karen. The idea of engaging the private sector in development cooperation is not new. I remember very well this idea floating around in the early days of my career. But the big question was how to do it right. Uh, there is, of course, the question of credibility, credibility for all sides involved, donors, private sector, partner countries, and civil society. And um, I want to focus also a little bit on the importance of evidence and roadmaps. We already, some speakers uh, highlighted um, a few important issues, and I would like to elaborate a little bit on this. Um, evidence proving positive effects on small farm livelihoods, including participation in farmers' organizations, as well as empowerment of rural youth and women, must form the basis for investments. And such evidence must come from a wide range of research organizations and countries to achieve the credibility I spoke earlier about. And the EU, for instance, is providing support to a range of projects, supporting this evidence gathering in various ways the food security portal, the 50 by 2030 initiative, and the global network against food crisis are some examples. Roadmaps bringing all evidence and actors together by aligning actions to end hunger through evidence-based pathways of high impact investments are essential to stay focused. 
and these actions clearly need to be responsible, green and long term. Once the evidence is established and the roadmap agreed, the mobilization of resources can literally flourish. We all know that hunger is on the rise, driven by climate, fragility, war, po poverty and COVID. The situation concerning hunger is extremely worrying and serious. We all have a responsibility to act. We in the European Union, with our member states and in the Global Donor Platform for Rural Development, with our members are taking this responsibility very seriously. Just a few days ago, we met with our member states in Helsinki and the GDBRD convened last a few months ago here in Rome. And tomorrow we will actually discuss with the Zero Hunger Coalition how the GDBRD can be involved in the coalition. Let me conclude by highlighting that as the crisis worsens every day, we must act fast and with determination. Responsible green and long-term private sector engagement hand in hand with donors and partner countries is indispensable on the road towards zero hunger. Thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you, Conrad. I think important messages about the, 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 um, the engagement with private sector being a, not a new idea um, and the need to do that with credibility the importance of empowering rural youth and women in everything that's done, the importance of using a wide range of evidence base from research organizations and avoiding trying to use, I guess, single sources. Um, and we then, we also heard from, from, from Zambia about the importance of linking to the national pathways, to countries' national pathways, to countries' national plans, um, the importance of responding to local needs and local ownerships. Um, our next speaker is Christine Campo from CARE, CARE International. Christine, you were very active in the, in the UN Food System Summit and in connecting to these national pathways. Um, how do you think we can do a better job of connecting with these national pathways, of building on that momentum that exists? Thanks for that introduction, Karen, and good day, everyone uh, in the room and online. Thank you for joining us. So the UN Food System Summit was one of the most inclusive UN-led processes of all time. As a result, we have 117 national pathways. These are whole of government, whole of society pathways that are now being designed, implemented, and, er, and funded. Um, probably the most valuable thing of the UN Food System Summit was, was the shift in mindsets. We really went from sectors to systems and from silos to intertwined destinies. Um, now with that system thinking, we need to shift that into systems action. So what role did CARE play in the Food System Summit and why are we still involved in the national pathways? So in 2019, CARE was honored to accept the invitation by the UN Secretary General to lead an action track on advancing equitable livelihoods. And for us, our goal was to shed the spotlight on the 4.5 billion people that support themselves and their family from the earnings that they that they receive across the food system. Um, it was our job to shed a light on their right to decent work and just remuneration. With our UN anchor, IFAD, uh, we reached out to other UN organizations such as ILO, UNHCR, FAO, their right to food department, and also their social protection department to make sure that we had the right institutional structures at our disposal throughout the 18 month process. We also had representation from the CFS secretariat, including the chair from the HLP to make sure that all the great things that are happening in this space this week are captured in the things that we were collecting in our action track. And because CARE is an NGO, we made sure um, to use our, mobilize our constituencies at national level by hosting 40 dialogues um, to really ensure that the right, that the voices of civil society and social movements were heard at national level in the development of these pathways. Um, so please allow me to give two country examples of how that played out. In CARE Nepal, we were instrumental in conducting, connecting local marginalized communities to programs and policy conversations that were occurring within government. Um, it, it was their expressed need to have institutionalized categorization based farmer identification. And as a result, the government of Nepal thought that was a great idea, noted the model, and is now part of their national pathway. Um, and, and they see it as an added value to protect and enhance social capital and reduce the risk for most marginalized farmers. 
Healthcare is now also partnering with the various levels of the Nepalese government to influence policy design and system strengthening to allow the adequate implementation of this model in the policies and programs at local, provincial, and federal level. A second example is from CARE Malawi. So CARE Malawi took a similar approach to Nepal and supported their government pathway creation. The CARE Malawi team is now focused on supporting the government implementation of the Affordable Input Program, which is a policy identified both by the marginal communities in Malawi and also the government itself. Throughout this process, CARE has been reviewing national pathways to make sure that they consider the needs of the most marginalized, especially women and girls. CARE focuses on women and girls um, because they're dis disproportionately affected by poverty. And I'm happy we're having this conversation again now this week at the CFS. If everybody started on the same place on that path out of poverty, we wouldn't need to focus on women and girls, but we're not there. That's not the case. We're not there yet. Um, True food systems transformation is only possible when women can claim their rights as leaders, innovator, farmer, caretakers, and the saleswomen that we are. And tackling these inequalities requires focused vision from all of the governments and stakeholders um, to, to move this forward. It also requires gender disaggregated data to track the responses and track the responses from civil society and monitoring whether these policies are having the desired effect. Now, moving in my last point to coalitions. So CARE is offering technical support upon request to gender equality through the Making Food Systems Work for Women and Girls, um, which is a coalition co-hosted co with Canada and FAO, and the Decent Work and Living in Incomes and Wages Coalition. If you would like to hear anything more about those two coalitions, there's a full side event about both happening both at the same time at 8.30 tomorrow morning. Um, we look forward to really building synergies with these coalitions, including the Healthy Diets Coalition and um, and the Zero Hunger Coalition. Lastly, I, I really look forward to civil society being invited to play a role in the Zero Hunger Coalition. I know CARE has done lots of surveys with our members in the 100 countries where we work. I know the CSIPM just did some great survey talking about where they see um, the needs most to, to resolve the food crisis. So we do welcome you to invite us into this work as we go forward. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. So that kind of wraps up our first part of this, um, this side event, which is really looking at the role of governments and what governments can do. And we're now going to move to the second part, where we're going to share more about what this zero hunger private sector pledge is all about, um, and what is what are companies doing who have pledged, as well as announcements of new pledges. Um, our, our first speaker is the new chair of the private sector mechanism or the new focal point of the private sector mechanism and the chair of the International Agri-Food Network, Michael Keller. Um, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, the private sector mechanism and the members of the private sector mechanism have been a huge source of those that have pledged. Um, and so we were thrilled to be able to co-organize um, this event with you. So, Michael, you have the floor. Thanks so much, Karin, your excellency, dear esteemed colleague. Um, first of all, I think building synergies, absolutely essential. Doing more, yes, and Maximo always is reminding us we have to do more. But we have also sometimes to celebrate, and we will celebrate in, in, in some moments. But I think more importantly, Speaking in the name of the private sector is also because we speak about responsibility. There's a shared responsibility also taken and to be taken by the private sector. We have to play our role also to contribute to um, zero hunger. It is clear as private um, sector mechanism, I'm extremely proud not only to be the chair of thousands of companies acting in 191 countries around the world, concretely acting also with farmers around the world. But I think I'm even more proud that we have yet over 44 companies being part and pledged to the zero hunger pledge. And I think the important one is also that we are speaking here, what is also the strength of the private sector? The strength of the private sector is its diversity. There are small companies, mid-sized companies, multinationals, there are cooperatives. 
And I think this is also, when you look on the list of those who are today part of the Black, you have this diversity also in the Black. And I think this also, we have certainly to continue to work to bring more in, but the diversity of companies, but also the geographic diversity of the companies where they are acting. I think this is also absolutely essential. The ample assembly of the CFS stakeholders during this plenary reinforces and you mentioned at the beginning, Karen, that we must strengthen multi-stakeholder and multi-sectoral coordination to achieve ending hunger. And long-term development is absolutely essential. And this can only happen to concerted efforts to build on science-based high impact actions. I think these actions, and I think we all agree, must happen in the countries most in need. I think this is absolutely essential. Whether it is the FAO Director General's hand-in-hand -hand initiative or national plans for of member states, we couldn't be more pleased to see the growing emphasis on investment in countries. One of the important things about the Zero Hunger Challenge is that includes the space where the private sector can make concretely one of its best contribution to development by investing directly into the agri-food value chain that build decent livelihood, what you mentioned also earlier before, and help to directly produce food. I think I'm extremely three times proud because now it's the most important thing. We have to announce something. I think I'm extremely proud today um, that we have or we we are crossing the threshold of a half a billion dollars today. Um, this is a milestone, which is tremendous, and the private sector mechanism is proud to be part of it. And we want to thank ETG, who will speak later on, for taking the program over the threshold. Ms. Carol, congratulations um, to you and the whole team ETG for the work you're doing on the ground in countries like Tanzania, Zambia, and so many others. That means you will shortly hear from diverse range of private sector groups. And I want again to highlight private sector groups acting in the South Southern Hemisphere, Partnership South, South. That means the whole diversity what we need also today um, and you will hear examples from Agria or from East West to show how on the ground investments and coordination um, is put in place. We need also multinationals investing in a wide range of countries. And we also have to appreciate the companies that have grown up in developing countries and have always been slogging in out in the trenches right there on the ground where it is needed the most. We celebrate the diversity of all these businesses, large, small, north and south. And I would like to thank here again, Karin, um, also Francine from Shamba, Steve and Lawrence from Gain, but also all the other partners, IFA, WFP, EU, FAO, um, Nigeria, Zambia, we heard for your leadership, the private sector is ready to take it up. And therefore, I'm now more than happy that we can listen also to concrete examples how we take it up. Thank you, Michael. So 44 companies, you heard it from Michael, 44 companies have mm -hmm. pledged now more than half a billion dollars um, to contribute towards zero hunger in the low and middle income countries. The latest pledge is from the export trading group ETG, and we have Carol Sohor here with us today to talk about what they've pledged. And that will then be followed by companies who have already pledged explaining what they've done, as well as an example from GAIN, the Global Alliance on Improved Nutrition, as to how they're working with SMEs to implement these pledges. So Carol, you have the floor. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm not going to talk in French because it's going to be uh, complicated on the other side, so I'm going to do that in English. So we have been uh, operating in Africa for more than five decades now, uh, building long-term sustainable agriculture with smallholder farmers, and we continue to expand our investment 
uh, in more than 30 African countries, even in, uh, in country that we could consider complicated. I'm thinking about uh, Malawi, Zimbabwe, where the, 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 it's strategic uh, for all uh, the food safety, and that's the mission of ETG. Uh, we create jobs uh, favoring as well uh, women, 50% of women are always recruited uh, when we have got a new investment. Uh, young people training uh, best agricultural practices for uh, smallholder farmers, how we can improve uh, as well uh, yield and crops. And uh, is the reason why we are completely aligned with the Zero Hunger uh, Pledge, uh, with ETG missions, uh, because finally, uh, um, uh, we look forward to engage more with uh, partnerships uh, to improve agricultural practices, but as well the food safety value chain. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Um, we now have online with us Micah Hrut from East West Seeds, um, who has recently made a pledge earlier this year. Micah, can you share with us how what East West Seeds pledge is and how you are implementing it? Micah, you have the floor. Thank you. I'm very excited to be here, also very proud and happy to join this coalition. Um, we have pledged, um, um, shall I come in with numbers, uh, 18 million US dollars uh, in the next five years to invest in farmer training. Um, we are a seed company, East West Seed. We are specialized in um, tropical vegetable seeds for smallholder farmers. Um, we were um, um, founded 40 years ago. Actually, we are celebrating our birthday this week. And uh, we have now about 23 million smallholder farmers that we deliver seeds to. Uh, we believe that uh, fighting hunger is basically fighting poverty. And uh, with uh, the majority of people in developing countries depending on farming for a living, uh, we want to supply them with tools. And the tools that we give them are better seeds, so seeds that give higher yields or that are resistant to diseases, pests, the effects of climate change. Uh, and we complement that with knowledge, with training in, um, in cultivation, but also in business skills or in connection to the markets. Um, over the last five years, we've um, trained approximately um, uh, 500,000 farmers, smaller farmers, many in Africa and in Asia. Um, and we uh, uh, we have pledged to uh, to bring this number um, up to an additional one million farmers in the next five years. Um, we see also uh, women are mentioned before that it's very important to focus on women farmers in our trainings, um, not only because they play an important role in agriculture, but also because we know that when they start uh, growing a better income, a better living, the it's often the children that benefit from that. And if they are trained to grow vegetables, also the nutritional value of that is enormous for the, uh, the families and the communities that they feed. Actually, uh, if I can make a little effort, we're organizing a, a conference on this theme on 25th on October on women farmers. So please welcome. Um, again, we're very excited to join this, um, this, um, this community of, of companies that pledge because we also realize that uh, uh, we cannot do this alone and we need to work with partners, with governments, with other seed companies, with NGOs to, uh, to be able to make a difference. So very happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Micah. And I will open the floor for questions um, after our final speaker has spoken. So please, if you do have a question, get it ready. I will open the floor. Our next speaker is, um, is Sherry Attilano from Agrea Agricultural Solutions, another company that has pledged in the Zero Hunger Private Sector Pledge. Sherry, can you tell us more about your pledge, what you're doing, and what you see as the role of SMEs in this Zero Hunger Private Sector Pledge? Sherry, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, it's evening for me in the Philippines. I'm so happy to join everyone. And second, I'm so happy to speak after Mikey Groot. I, I was just actually with her father celebrating the 40th anniversary of East West because I sit on their advisory board uh, in the Philippines. So as you see, this is not only you know, uh, supporting the government, but really business to business and private sector altogether. Um, 
Uh, luckily, actually, during the UN Food System Summit in Italy last time, I happened to help the government draft our national pathways. And the Zero Hunger Coalition is something that we really promote. And we even uh, created the Zero Hunger um, you know, Task Force in the Philippines. So I'm actually sit in the, in the national committee. So what we're doing in our company is we really want to strengthen localize our action on the country level. Because as much as we talk on a global level, the fight against uh, hunger and malnutrition is actually felt on the ground. Uh, especially now our company, both the Agria Company and the Agria Foundation are working together, not just on food security, but food and nutrition security. So in terms of that, uh, our second big pledge actually is to really support the consolidation of our smallholder farmers in the Philippines, especially those who are, um, recipients of the agrarian reform. So we still have around 17 million uh, smallholder farmers or most of them from the agrarian reform. They don't belong to any cooperatives and associations. And it is so hard to assist the government on really designing better government subsidies to these farmers unless they are consolidated so that it is more affected, better design, and it is in the roadmap of the national pathways, a commitment of the Philippine government to the UN Food System Summit. Another one, I'm very active also in really investing on farm development, especially on the health of the soil. Uh, as part of our personal advocacy and our company's advocacy on nutrition, that if we make our soil healthier, we actually also solve our nutrition problem because whatever we get from the soil go goes on our plants and goes on our livestock also, whatever the livestock would eat, that's also our nutrition. So in that aspect, we're actually designing on how to transition our farmers to sustainable agricultural practices, especially on regenerative agriculture, which is actually one of the major discussion during the UN Food Systems uh, pre-summit and summit. And lastly, uh, we're also big uh, in terms of our commitment to women and the youth. In the Philippines, our company is partnered with state universities and colleges. 73 of them all signed up to work with us uh, to influence 1.6 million agri-related um, students in, in these universities to really focus on how we support our national pathways. So um, I think at the end of the day, uh, of course, you know, we signed up for globalization for so many years, right? But with all this pandemic and the crisis in food and, you know, the fuel, fertilizer and finance, the four Fs, as they said, it needs to be, you know, promoting on locally produced, locally consumed and lo locally owned kind of intervention. So those are the pledges that we did in our company and, and also our foundation working with the government and other private sectors. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cherie, for um, giving us, sharing us more about what you're doing, but also re-emphasizing this importance of local ownership, local initiatives, aligning with the national food system pathways. Our last speaker before I open the floor for questions is Steve Godfrey, who's the Director of Policy at GAIN. But he's also really one of the masterminds behind both the Zero Hunger Coalition and the Zero Hunger Private Sector Pledge. So it's great to have you with us, Steve. Steve, can you share a bit how this idea of having implementing organizations like GAIN, working with these companies to implement their pledge, how does that, how's that happening? And, and what do you think is the, the important role of the implementing organization? Yeah. Excellencies, colleagues. Well, coming last, I have the disadvantage that most of the interesting things have already been said. So I'll try and be a bit controversial. Um, I know it's long into the afternoon. I want to start really with something Maximo said. I thought he put the polar issues we need to deal with very well here. He talked about solidarity on the one side, but also impact on the other. So sentiment is important, but it's not enough. And I think right from the beginning, when we thought about this in the context of the Food System Summit, the uh, food um, action track one that, that uh, Lawrence Haddad and those of us in game were most engaged in working on. You know, we saw that there is a continuum of problems in the food system. And actually one thing we share in the food system with all of those in the climate is most of the indicators are going in the wrong direction, like they are for climate. So if you look at hunger, it's going up. If you look at vitamin and micronutrient deficiencies, big new report coming out this week showing it's probably twice as big as we thought for the last 30 years. Work on quality of diet that 
Sophie report, you know, a report coming out next week looking on diet quality with Gallup and a number of others showing it's a lot worse than we even thought. But I mean, hunger is the foundation. The absence of hunger is the most important litmus test of the quality of any food system. So when we looked at the discussions going on in the Food Systems Summit, a lot of it was focusing on upstream food system reforms, food safety, things that are really fundamental and critical to a, a sort of resilient, stable and sustainable food system. But on hunger, there wasn't an awful lot being uh, said. And actually, to his credit, it was Lawrence, really, who said, you know, looking at the turbulence in the markets, um, there's so much money being made by some players in the markets, we should be making sure they put some of that back into the system. And so we started, we actually quite, what turned out to be, in a way, a bit of a naive idea, which was we could capture some of the billions being made in unusual profits, as they are now in the energy sector by some companies, and channel those more towards uh, uh, interventions around hunger. It didn't work, of course, because it's not really how companies operate. But we came up, I think, through the consultations with the governments and the stakeholders in that work, with what is a much more long-term sustainable and impactful uh, uh, idea, which is to try and align regular business investment existing in new with the social and economic development goals of eliminating hunger. This is a much more powerful tool if we can get it right. And I think, you know, we've come a very long way already in a year, but we have so much further to go. And the instruments that have been developed with the support of the Rome-based agencies, I think are good. I mean, we have basic criteria. In order to be part of this, you have to meet a number of basic uh, standards the guidelines of CFS on responsible investment, um, the, uh, the, um, uh, the guidance on corruption, doing business, the BMS code, the code of conduct on the uh, marketing breast milk substitutes and global compact principles. But underneath that, we've looked at, well, what would a commitment mean in practice? So I think the idea is that for every single significant commitment, we would have a, a way to work with the company concerned through its partner to report on impact and that impact's important. It's not just important, I think we tend to think sometimes from the non-private sector, importance of, of, of this kind of accountability is because we have to make sure, like we do with governments, when they make spending plans, they deliver on them, it's measured and we can say it was done. I think the accountability with the private sector is important for that reason, but my impression is actually, it's kind of become a reverse thing. Companies are very anxious about making any commitment they can't report on because they've been, they've been criticized so many times for making kind of large commitments that they can't deliver on or can't prove that they delivered. But I think it's important for another reason. That was something that's, if you like, infused the discussions of all of the presentations today, which is that this is a massive learning opportunity. If we can really figure out how, through initiatives like this, through FAO's hand in hand, if we can really figure out how you properly align business investment with these national development goals around high priorities like eliminating hunger from your food system, then we've got a much more powerful tool to really bring about sustainable change. So I think that the, um, the great thing about the uh, Hunger Coalition, it's all potential. It's just, you know, as the private sector pledges, half a billion is a lot of money, but if we can make it work, that will be the beginning of the flow of investment. And so I hope that from this session, which one of the ideas right from the beginning was, we use this session to get both the ideas, the, the, the criticism or the questions that need to be answered, but also evidence of those who are prepared in this process here this week, but also going forward to show the solidarity needed to make the Hunger Coalition a very effective instrument. Thanks. Thank you, Steve. The floor is open. We have about 72 people um, on the Zoom call. So those of you joining us virtually, please feel free to either put in the chat or the Q&A box your questions. Um, otherwise, I'm going to take some questions from the floor. So I have, please, if you take the floor, please introduce yourself and then ask your questions. So the gentleman over here and then the lady over there, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much. This is Stefano Maras from Bayer. Uh, Bayer has contributed to uh, the Zero Hunger Pledge uh, with a commitment of $160 million. Um, and uh, uh, 
it's really a great thing because I think that for the first time, actually, it was asked to the private sector to align investment to the needs of countries instead of asking for donations, for instance, or something that was not financially appealing to the private sector and sustainable on the long run. But asking us, asking the private sector to actually make a pledge based on investments, either existing or uh, planned, it, it was a very, very good and smart move to align the private sector and the governments and the organizations like uh, FAO, for instance. And one important thing is that one of the five uh, investments that we include in our pledge is the better life farming, for instance. And next week, going to going back to what uh, Maximo was saying, we're actually uh, going to meet some countries at the Hand in Hand Initiative uh, Investment Forum to take the better life farming and try to find synergies with Hand in Hand specific uh, projects and initiatives that the countries need to support. So thank you very much for the opportunity that uh, again and uh, the other members, the other partners of the Zero Hunger Pledge gave uh, Bayer and other companies and hopefully our pledge will uh, also uh, push other companies to, to do the same. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Mrs. Chair. Uh, Florence Egal, UN Habitat. Uh, in UN Habitat, we're particularly interested in the leave no one behind aspect. I was very pleased to hear Massimo Torero referring to territorial approaches, which are very close to our heart also. Uh, and But one thing, and absolutely legitimate to start looking in which are the areas where you can make the best use of natural resources to revive the economy and ensure food security in the country. But it's equally important to look at those areas that year after year and decade after decade have been affected by conflict, droughts. Um, it's always the same areas where we, we make the headlines in severe undernutrition. In those areas, it is going to be particularly important to try and rebuild resilient food systems. And that means working with small scale farmers, but also very much working with uh, small scale food processes. There's a lot of jobs to be developed there, to be supported in those areas, to help uh, local people, including youth and women, to make the best of their experience, their traditions, local biodiversity, to make a living and revive local economy. And private sector has a major role to support these micro uh, my, uh, private sector initiatives. There are a lot of examples in many uh, countries of private sectors that have kind of adopted communities and help them moving on. So we're very much looking forward to learn more of what's going on. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have a question from um, Zoom from Eyal Bloch from Top Technology. Um, and I think this question, I'm gonna ask Cherie to answer it because she spoke about this. But the question is, do you consider precision agriculture with regenerative agriculture um, as a complementary way to adapt to climate change and achieve zero hunger. So Sherry, I'm, I'm asking you to answer that because you're the one who spoke about how your investments are supporting regenerative agriculture. So if you could um, answer that question, but wait, before you do, I just wanna see if there's any other hands from the floor. This is your last chance. Yes, one, two, three, and then we close. Uh, thank you. Uh, question that is actually Perry, perfect. I'm just going to wait and let them answer and then I'll give you the floor. Sorry, just so you can prepare yourself. So one, where was my one, two, three. Thank you, moderator. My name is Jihana Jishti. I work for OCP Group, uh, a plant nutrition and fertilizer uh, world leader based in Morocco. Um, I had a question regarding the implementation of the pledge. Uh, once so we hear a lot of high big figures and we hope that uh, they will come to concrete uh, actions and, uh, and achievements on the ground. Is the Zero Hunger Coalition planning on having a monitoring tool to follow the, the, the implementation of the inv investments? And what are the KPIs I, I, that you are planning on following? Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you. My name is Ola Wale uh, from Repeople Concepts Nigeria. I'd like to ask um, how small 
SMEs like us can uh, pledge and how we can align with others who are actually investing in Nigeria. Thank you. Uh, I am Abla Mahadi from Hawa Organization Society Sudan. My English is not well, but I try to reflect my question. I would like to ask our, the moderator here, I ask you, do you think we can reach zero hunger? This big question, because now you know this word in Ukraine, make, make this zero hunger more complicated. And also for us in Africa, in an Arab country, we have sanction from USA to this country and we have resources, but by this sanction, we cannot use our resources. Do you think we can reach zero hunger by this political issue which affected us in our country, in Africa, in Asia, in, we can't. Better we have solved this political issue, then we can reach this zero hunger. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm going to take one last question, and then I'm going to ask Maximo to answer the questions that were answered to him, Cherie on the regenerative precision agriculture, and Steve on the reporting mechanism. Sir. Thank you. Uh, my name is Abul Azad. I'm a resource lead with the 50 by 2030 initiative. I have a quick question on the on the private sector pledge. Uh, the question is like, to what extent you are focusing on the need for evidence to inform policies to address zero hunger? Thank you. Maximo. I answer in general. Or? There was one question that came to you. I'm now I'm losing it, but you can answer in general if you want. But there was one question, oh, from UN Habitat about the territorial approaches. Oh, okay, no, no, no problem. Uh, on, on the on the territorial approaches, we, we look at both, no? So hand in hand, we, we call it green and red. Red are the ones that you were referring to, which are the ones that normally are always in crisis and very difficult to move out. It's very complex, as you well know. Uh, we are trying to find ways in which we can provide those households which are always hit by conflict and so on, different tools that they can use at least to cope better with what they are doing. So it's more like a portfolio approach uh, of tools that will help them to react better and to respond better to those type of shocks that are recurring, while in the meantime, we try to attract them to the green areas, which we call our areas of, of potential. So it's a dual approach uh, component, but we don't want to let them continue to be as they are. That's why we believe innovating with several tools that they can have in hand to minimize the impacts of the recurrent shocks that they face while we try to attract them to areas where we have more agricultural potential right now. Now, sadly, in some cases, you have conflict zones where there is enormous agricultural potential. Uh, and that's something also that we need to try to figure out a way to, to change. Uh, regarding the, the comment by, by Sudan, you're, you're, you're right, it's very complex, the situation we have. But we have two choices. Do we wait until the political problem is solved? Or we do something now, let me, let me finish, or we do something now also to try to cope with that and try to find best ways to, to move out. Honestly, the challenge of zero hunger by 2030 is very far, very far. But at least, our hope, at least my hope, my personal hope, is that we can change the trend. The trend is wrong. We need to change it. We need to go in the correct way. So we have to do what we can do with our tools, and that's what we can provide here the FAO as a technical agency, tools to, to, to move forward. Um, and then um, there was the, the other issue of the m and &E, which I think you will answer, but I will completely support the m and &E of, of, the, of, the, of the commitments. So Steve, before I hand over to you, I wanna give the floor to Cherie to answer the question on precision agriculture, and then I pass over to Steve. Um, thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me okay? Thank you very much for that question, actually. That's a very practical question because uh, regenerative agriculture is very context specific. So for example, in our company, we're promoting regenerative agriculture with great due respect 
first to the indigenous communities that we work with because most of their land are untouched and we don't we don't want to pollute those lands you know and uh, another one is also uh, context specific to a lot of our, uh, our 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 markets they want sustainably sourced and regenerative agriculture that promotes biodiversification some of them didn't even want to go just purely organic but really more biodiversification for the smallholder farmers to adopt more on climate changes by layering their income better uh, sources of um, uh, income also from their farm and another one on precision agriculture this is like so uh, recent uh, even in the philippines you know there are some land that are actually super polluted in terms of macronutrients focusing on ntks and precision agriculture is something that we are actually uh uh, committing to the national pathways by even doing soil laboratory tests in different areas in the Philippines because we have 7,107 islands and only few with soil laboratory tests. So the, basically, most of our soil never tested, but so much uh, government subsidies are just ruining uh, our soil because they never tested. And now the work on precision agriculture is something to be prioritized to rehabilitate the soil, but at the same time, transition the soil for better farming. Um, I just wanted to answer to those two questions from the two colleagues in the middle row there together. I think evidence to impact is the spine of this whole thing. I mean, the root of the initial concept is evidence-based analysis of series 2030, that if you do these things, you will impact hunger. And there's been pretty good consensus around those. No one is saying this is wrong, this is right. So that's the impact piece. Yeah, I think it, it's fundamental. It's fundamental not because we want to be sure we're holding everyone to account. It's fundamental because we want this to be a bigger initiative. And I think that can only come from good evidence. And that requires good M&E. Now, there are a couple of maybe things we should say right from the beginning. You know, the very first pledge we got for this was from an SME, I think, in, in Kenya. I think it was for $500. Yeah, you, yeah and, you know, this is still a real pledge. We're not going to be able to do detailed m and &E on this kind of level of pledge. We're looking at scale. So I think we're looking at anything that's a significant scale, maybe a half a million, a million, has to go through a process. And that will be done on a, we, we've already talked to the World Benchmarking Alliance about making sure that the indicators are correct. How we will do it is not through a centralized mechanism. It will be through aggregating reports around individual commitments done with the partners. So it might be the government of a particular country is the partner for that investment, that will be the way it's done. So I think there's a really strong commitment to make the uh, learning and M&E and whatever you want to call it, evidence impact assessment, very serious for you know the simple reason that this is something that we need if we're to make the initiative bigger. The second comment I would make is a little bit to a colleague in, in Sudan and the general comments have been made about, I mean, when you talk about private sector investment, you are inevitably talking about countries which have got relatively functioning market economies. And this is often not the case where you have high levels of conflict. So although this is an initiative open to all countries highly affected, for the private sector piece, by definition, it's bound to be focused on countries that are relatively more stable um, and the, the particular problems of countries with very high burdens of hunger and food insecurity rely on our colleagues at WFP, the UN system, and those other emergency intervention agencies. Thanks. Thank you, Steve. We have run out of time. Thank you, everyone, for being with us today, both in person and virtually. Thank you so much to our co-organizers, to our panelists. Um, please, if you want to join the Zero Hunger Coalition or the Zero Hunger Private Sector Pledge, it is open to everyone. So to the gentleman who asked the question about the Nigerian SMEs, any company can make a pledge through the Zero Hunger Private Sector Pledge, and any member state, any civil society, any international organization can join the Zero Hunger Coalition and help us shape it and accelerate this action that we want to see, accelerate the coordination, and try and reverse the trend that's been going in the wrong direction for the past few years. So thank you and enjoy the rest of CFS.